Hello, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Chaim Israel, Global Strategies and Head of Thematic Investing in Bank of America Global Securities. I'm so pleased and honored today to be joined by Jack Hilary, the co-founder and CEO of Sandbox, uh, one of the global leaders of AI quantum computing that we're going to speak about today, about the revolution. We all live in the capital markets. And if you, let me ask the question, if you were an institutional investor, and you know, this revolution is happening, so many companies are right now in the far front of that or about to implement that or going to be impacted by that. What are the key things I need to examine? Meaning, okay, I'm going and meeting managements, I'm going and meeting companies, I'm doing all my analysis. What are the key questions that I need to ask management? What are the key focuses? Uh, what's how my analysis needs to change going forward? It's a great question, Haim. Uh, I myself was a public company CEO for a number of years. Uh, I've been on the boards of public companies, and uh, it's very important that this dialogue happen between institutional investors, representatives of the retail investors as well, at banks like Bank of America, where there's a huge retail uh, investor presence as well, and the management teams. And this quarterly dialogue that happens when companies issue their earnings and then calls happen, these are very important calls. And so if I could, Haim, I'm gonna bring up uh, just one slide that can give us some perspective on the kind of questions I think uh, we could be asking. And I think you can see the slide now. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, it is again. Great. So, you know, two two kinds of questions to ask. I just put some representative questions up here, and certainly investors can adapt it to their particular sector that they're focused on. But there's two parts of the ledger. There's the productivity and growth side to make sure that the management teams that you're entrusting your money with uh, are doing the fiduciary duty that they have to use that shareholder money and to maximize the value for shareholders and other stakeholders. That's on the left side. On the right side, equally as important is the risk management and cybersecurity to make sure that management teams are aware of and acting on the various risks that are now much more heightened by these kinds of technology. Let's start with the left side, Haim, and then we can jump to the right side. On the left side, you know, we have to really look at sector by sector. So if we're talking to a management team, for example, in the biopharma and the uh, biotech area, we have to ask some tough questions. We know the stats and the numbers of biotech and pharma. We know that 80 to 90% of their drug candidates fail in clinical trials. We know that the return on investment is not great because of that. One of the reasons, for example, if you look at the market caps of the largest biotechs and pharmas out there, the maximum you can see is a few hundred billion dollars. Most of them, much less than that. Very successful biotechs. You're talking about billions to tens of billions. And you compare that to the tech world, where on a regular basis now, we see more and more trillion dollar market caps, right? With Microsoft, Alphabet, Amazon, Apple, now NVIDIA, and others joining the trillion dollar club. And certainly even many more you could find uh, in the many more hundreds of uh, billions of dollars in the 500 billion to trillion range. But we don't find that in pharma and biotech. And one of the reasons for that, and this has been written about by yourself and others uh, in the analyst team there, is that the hit-based um, lumpiness of the biotech sector is really holding it back. And so if you look at a lot of early stage biotechs, even though the ones that go public with no revenues and they're banking everything on great results from a particular clinical trial, and then there's a lot of excitement when that trial is going to be reported out. Is it great? Is it not great? And it's boom and bust. So if you're talking to a management team of a biotech and pharma, the key questions to ask is, now the tools exist, management team, to move from boom and bust, hit-based business, to a systematic, predictable lower risk business that on a continual basis turns out one after the other successful drugs. Now the, the, the AI technology combined with simulation and other tools in the toolbox, like knowledge graphs we talked about, Haim, these tool sets now can turn a hit-based bad business model into a much stronger business model. One of the reasons why the marketplace, the capital markets reward Enterprise software companies, such as Salesforce and others, with great valuations is 
the annuity revenue, the predictability of that of that revenue stream. Wouldn't it be great if we had that in the biotech and biopharma area? So that's one set of questions I would ask about if you're talking to biotech and pharma. If we're talking, for example, to automotive or aerospace, are they using these technologies to advance not just customer service? Of course, they should be using Gen AI to advance customer service, to lower risk, to increase customer experience, positivity in, in customer experience there. But how about the deeper part of the company itself? How about the actual alloys being used to create the actual chassis of the, of the car? How about the batteries? We all know that batteries are the future in terms of getting to an EV future. Look at China. They've now taken the lead spot as number one exporter of battery electric vehicles in the world today. Look at the investments that BYD has put in. Look at the investments that other companies have put in. Uh, there's a real reason why Warren Buffett took a stake in BYD, as it's known in China, or BYD, uh, you know, in, in English. BYD, based in Shenzhen, is now a superstar, right? And look at their earnings. Look at the return on shareholder value because of their investment in these new kinds of battery technologies. And so if we're talking to an automotive player, an aerospace player, a battery maker, these are tough questions we've got to start asking right now. Not just the peripheral questions of, are you using Gen AI on your website? Are you using it to manage your content? Those are, those are fine ways to use Gen AI. But now we've got to go deeper into the guts of the companies uh, themselves. If we're talking to the media industry, if you're on the line with an earnings call and you have the opportunity to talk to the heads of a big media company, again, this is now core disruptive in terms of how we create media in the future. With huge repositories of past um, you know, episodes of Simpsons, as an example, you can now easily ask an AI to create a thousand more of these kinds of episodes. Are these companies investing in this technology? Are they doing that in order to create product uh, at vastly lower costs and greater customer satisfaction? One of the core points that has been lost, I think, Chaim, in all of this area, and you've written about it a bit, and I think I'm sure you'll write about it more, is that the productivity gains that we're seeing now from AI and other technologies are gonna transform the leisure time of all of us as consumers. And you've written a bit about this, that we're gonna have more free time to consume content. Well, who's gonna create this content? We don't wanna just keep watching reruns of Seinfeld, as much as I love Seinfeld. We wanna see new kinds of content, hopefully some even educational content. And so there's an opportunity here uh, on the education front, on the content front for media companies. And so some key questions around, are you using this kind of technology in your core of the business, not just the peripheral of customer um, servicing and things like that? And then let's turn now, Haim, if we could, to the right side of this slide and cyber and risk management. Here again, we have not seen leading management teams embrace this well enough yet. A handful of folks have done that, but the majority of companies that are publicly listed companies have not yet stepped up to embrace the risk and the threat in a zero trust environment when it comes to cyber technology, when it comes to ransomware, when it comes to encryption, when it comes to these core areas that AI and other frontier tech is so good at breaking. We really have to embrace that now. So if you were an investor listening to this, listening to Haim and myself right now, and you're going to be talking to management teams, these are some of the tough questions on the right side. We would also think about um, how do you protect your core trade secrets? A company like Coca-Cola has chosen for more than 100 years not to patent the formula of Coke, but to keep it as a trade secret. Companies like um, uh, Humana and other hospital corporations that have millions of records, uh, personal identifiable information of patient records. Uh, if you look at the large insurance companies, if you're talking to an insurance company, health insurance, personal insurance, liability insurance, any of the big insurance carriers, they're talking about huge, vast arrays of PII, personal identifiable information. PII has with it huge responsibility and risk if you don't handle PII well as a management team, you're going to be faced with hundreds of millions of dollars of fines. And those companies that have faced that understand that. 
And so how are you protecting that PII with and with the best tools to protect it against AI and other modern technology? So Chaim, in summary, these are some of the questions I would I would recommend asking, but maybe you you know you have some particular thoughts on the kinds of questions institutional investors might want to address to certain sectors. No, I think you you address it quite you know quite structurally because when we usually institutional investors you know they ask you no know, questions about you know the revenue side. No one is really looking about the risk side. That's why I really like your slide here because first of all you have to understand the risks. I'm not sure that management and companies in some sectors and some areas really understand the risks. Um, and we all know that value can be created very fast, but can be destroyed even faster. So I really like the fact that uh, how you split between what do I need to ask management. First of all, I would even go with you know, one step ahead of it, uh, meaning it's like you know, 50,000 feet. How my question that I'm asking companies and I'm meeting with a lot of companies these days in many different areas and sectors, how serious, what do you think on this technology? Like, you no, know, very broad, I know it's a very broad question. That gives you a sense many times on management ceos how serious are they we i think with jack we under we agree this is the technology that is taking the world by storm right now as we call it in our research an iphone moment on steroids an internet moment on steroids and that's going to change everything i need to understand first and foremost how serious about you on the technology and companies that are just not serious are not doing the work today uh, we'll have a very, very tough time tomorrow. We do know that in every sector out there, companies are doing the work, a lot of work, very detailed work, investing a lot of resources and IPs and consulting and whatever to understand what's going on right now. And companies that are just waking up to the party today, I starting to think it's a little bit too late. Then you're asking all those questions about the revenues opportunities and of course, and all the risk factors. And, you know, some business intelligence would also be interesting here to ask, you know, what do you know your competitors are doing? What do you think, how they're addressing it? Um, where, how, where do you find the risks in terms of regulation here, the liabilities, if I'm implementing technology? So all those kind of questions have to be asked today. And I have to say, Jack, from, uh, from a capital market point of view, the sell side, the buy side, the investor world really gets it. And I'm seeing very serious approach by the capital market, by the investor community about that, um, which is feeding into the companies themselves, which is, I think, very, very encouraging. Yeah, I would just add to that, Haim. I agree with you. I think that there are some companies definitely taking it seriously. Where, where I would recommend institutional investors really now bear down uh, with their management teams that they work with is to go beyond just the peripheral usage of these technologies. Asset allocation strategies, portfolio construction strategies, portfolio optimization, risk management, risk exposure. All this now, there's an opportunity to raise that up a notch, right? As we think about both AI and simulation, the ability to simulate billions and billions of possible portfolio constructions. The ability to simulate billions of possible scenarios in terms of interest rates rising, interest rates falling. So I would just recommend institutional investors take the next step. Let's go beyond the surface, deeper in, and make sure that companies are using this tech in a deeper way. And that's the opportunity now. You mentioned that some companies are coming late to the party. If you find yourself investing in a company coming a little late to the party, here's the good news. There's an opportunity for them to leapfrog because they can go deeper than their competitors in the use of this technology. And again, I would just leave, Chaim, our, our listeners today with the idea of a, of a more complete toolbox. We love Gen AI. It's very exciting. It's very fun and visceral to interact with it, asking it questions, getting back answers. But there's many more tools in the toolbox. Wow. What an ending to a, a conversation that I could continue forever and ever. Thank you so much for your time. And I can't wait for the next chapter. Thanks, Haim.